Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon of our Together for Learning Youth Summit. Uh, this is the first of four side events that we'll be having this afternoon, our Displaced Youth Human Library. My name is Kathleen Flindapa. I'm our Director for Education, Gender-Based Violence and Child Protection at Global Affairs Canada. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I recognize that we work in different places and that you may therefore be joining this event from a different Indigenous territory. And I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on and acknowledge this. For me, this means thinking about the displacement that Indigenous populations have experienced here in Canada and around the globe, and to consider how I can contribute to reconciliation. I'd like to remind everyone that there will be simultaneous interpretation for our event, available in French, English, Spanish, Arabic, and ASL. I'd also encourage you to please keep your global chat open for this session, as we will be using it for the Q&A after each speaker. When you pose a question in the global chat, uh, appreciate that we can see your name or let us know where you're from uh, so that we can ensure that we are attributing your question appropriately. The way this will work is after each speaker tells their story, our moderator will pose select questions from the global chat uh, to allow an opportunity to engage more with our participants in the human library. A member of my team is monitoring the chat throughout this session to capture these questions. So now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator for this session, Her Excellency Carolina Gay, Canada's Ambassador to the Republic of El Salvador. Over to you, Madam Ambassador. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for the very warm welcome. Uh, it is an honor to be here to serve as your moderator uh, for today's session. Thank you to everyone joining us today. This side event provides an opportunity for attendees to become more acquainted with a few members of the Canada's Together for Learning uh, Campaign's Refugee Education Council. Their stories and reason for becoming passionate advocate for ensuring children and youth have access to quality and inclusive education. As you may have heard from our Minister of International uh, Development this morning, the Government of Canada believes it is essential that those who are the most affected by global decision-making, including refugees and internally displaced people and host communities, particularly girls and young women, are meaningfully included in decision-making. By inviting them to the table and truly listening to what they have to say, we can make sure that our actions are relevant, effective, and transformational. And I must say, as Canada's ambassador here in El Salvador, I've been working very closely with government, with civil society, with uh, UN organizations such as UNICEF to provide these spaces. And, and I've truly seen the transformational aspect that it can bring uh, to our beneficiaries. Storytelling is a tool in refugee advocacy. It is important to center refugee voices and experiences by facilitating safe spaces for people with lived experience to tell their stories in their own voices. Tomorrow morning, we will hear from several council members when they release their anthology. Today, we will get to hear from a few of them and have an opportunity to ask questions. So I'm very delighted once again to be able to be part of this conversation, and I'm looking forward to hearing from a few of the Refugee Education Council members about what drives their passion and advocacy to ensure no one is left behind. So without further ado, please help me join in welcoming Mongera Christine to start the session. Mongera is a high school teacher in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. She's passionate about providing quality education to all children in her community, especially girls. So welcome Mongera, you have five minutes and the floor is yours. Very happy to see you this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mangere Christine. I'm a teacher from Kakuma Refugee Camp in Kenya. Uh, this is um, my sixth year working there. I'm a graduate from the Catholic University of East Africa. And um, the reason as to why I chose to become a teacher is because I, I, I really wanted to change somebody's life through education. And while I was in school, um, 
uh, at the university level, I met five refugees, five or four of whom were men, and one of them was a lady. And I remember asking them uh, how they got to my school, and they said it was through a scholarship. So um, my my biggest concern was why do you have uh, four gentlemen and only one lady for this scholarship? And I remember the the, the lady telling me there are so many challenges that surround um, the girl child in the Kakuma refugee camp. And that's the reason why you can see I'm the only one who got this opportunity. And I remember I told her that um, I wanted to go work where you're coming from. And she was like, no, you know, uh, this place needs somebody who is uh, hardened by life to go and work with refugees. And I told her I think I was, I was okay trying to go work in such a place. And at that time, that was in 2017, we had only one organization that was handling education and that's Windle International. So I went there, I told them I wanted uh, to become a teacher in one of, the, one of the schools, either in Dadab camp or in Kakoma camp. Uh, after a whole year of following up, eventually they employed me. I got to Kakoma refugee camp. And I remember my first day in school, I found very many students at the assembly. The school had like 3,500 students. And surprisingly enough, only 300 of them were girls. And I got very concerned. I remember asking myself, why do we have only 300 girls against almost 3,000 and something boys? And there was lots of chronic absenteeism. So I found out that some were breastfeeding. They were on um, a maternity leave. Others were expectant and felt shame being in school and others were feeling a lot of stigma going to school because boys used to laugh at them and ask them why you're going to school what for you can be married and i took the initiative when they advertised for teachers that could undergo a training at certificate level for um, guidance and counseling i took it up um I came back to school. I started talking to the girls. We formed um, a life skills program or a club where we could talk to the girls and encourage them to be in school. And we would discuss issues around topics they would choose, whether it's about pregnancy, sexual health, or whether it's about um, about life. We would invite um, um, people from the IRC to come and talk to, to the girls. Then... I also ended up setting up a mentorship program to encourage the girls to stay in school, whether you're expectant or not, and also working with girls out of the school. And this was a very difficult task because I remember going to pick some girls from the community to bring them, them, to bring them back to the school, and the community would attack me for trying to bring back the girls back to, to school. But eventually, um, some um, like a child protection organization would come in and pick these girls and take them to the safe heavens. Then also um, we decided that probably it was good to have peer counselors. So we also picked some students that were willing to train basics on, on counseling so that they could become peer counselors. Then the other thing is becoming the teacher that... Um, is the focal person for students with disability in the school. Uh, a day, a normal day in um, one of the classes would mean teaching 100 to 120 students in, in a class. And you really have to be careful when you're writing on the board and turning around not to push a student's book because they are seated exactly up to the front and some sit on the floor without even forgetting how hot Kakuma is. And the classrooms are made out of iron sheets. And you find students sharing a book, like one book shared by 10 students or 12 of them. And the resources are not enough. The sanitation, you have like 10 toilets against these 3,500 students 
Um, and the other challenge was, uh, and what most of the members of the community do not want to discuss about is the lack of adequate um, psychosocial support. And unfortunately, we had, um, um, towards the end of last year, we had a student committing suicide. And I remember when I went to visit the family, the mother was like, um, you know, my, my, my son yesterday told me he did not want to see us living in this dire poverty. And then COVID-19 had taken away his excitement of being in school. And so he decided to commit suicide. Before the end of the year, we had another student, like five year old in the neighboring school, a primary school also committing suicide and then followed by a parent living around, around eight children behind. These challenges are there. And for me, I actually feel they will still be there in the next five years if they're not addressed. Um, and someone would ask, uh, why did I choose to be in the council? This was an answered prayer for me, to be very honest. Uh, for a very long time, I used to ask myself, what can I do for my students, for students within Kakuma refugee camp, for um, uh, displaced persons? And when this opportunity came, honestly, I felt I need to grab it. I need the world to know about the refugees. I need the world to think about them. I need the world to do something to help change the life of the refugees, to improve their education, to have more inclusive type of, of, um, of education, to be able to have the psychosocial support provided for them. Because unfortunately, in Kakuma refugee camp, we only have one organization, which is JRS, that um, handles psychosocial support. And I know these people are very overwhelmed because even the teachers, they're not able to handle some of these um, cases, what do they do? They forward them to the JRS. And coincidentally, I've been having students coming for counseling and they bring their parents too. You overstretch yourself as a teacher. You, you have to do this. You sacrifice the time, but it's for a worthy course. At the end of the day, I, it's one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done for, for, me, for myself and for other people. Thank you so much. So much for sharing your story. Um, I was struck by uh, your emphasis on psychosocial support and also in your uh, willingness and your desire to do something, right? To really get involved and be able to, to support uh, your community. And I commend you for that. Um, this is the part where we ask questions. I have one question that I received already that I'll pose right away. Uh, but please, uh, also to those that have joined you us this morning, do not hesitate to use the global chat to ask some more. So I actually have two, but I'll ask, I'll ask the first one. As a teacher, what do you think are the key ingredients for quality education? I would, I would still insist on, for quality education, we need um, a lot of counseling because at the moment I'm dealing with students who are traumatized by uh, life experiences they went through in the past. And I think we strongly need a very strong office for counseling so that students can at least first go through counseling before they come to class. We cannot teach a person who is mentally not well. So I believe that would be the first thing. And um, the second thing is having an um, inclusive kind of education where we have their gen gender balance, where we we are, well, where we are having, or we have, sorry, you use gender neutral language when appropriate when dealing with the students, and also I would talk about technology. Most of the children in um, the camps are deprived. The majority have never seen a computer. Uh, some do not know how to handle a tablet, which I think sometimes in learning we have to see for you to believe and for you to understand. So those are the three things, inclusive education, psychosocial support, and also to have um, digital learning included in, 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 in their studies. Excellent answers. Thank you so much. Uh, the second and last question 
Um, the person uh, that yeah. asked it wants to know more about the mentorship program or how have you managed to get the support for all uh, you've managed to do and how to best support teachers in general? Um, the mentorship program have not been alone. Most of the time what I do, I pick um, students who have been considered by the WUSC program for a scholarship to come talk to, the, to my students because sometimes when they see their own making it and succeeding academically and coming back to talk to them, I, I feel um, it's one of the best ways for them to actually, you know, get motivated in, in studies. And also, I'm not doing this without the help of UNHCR. Sometimes I approach them, they provide me with um, a few speakers that can come talk to the students. Sometimes they can pick um, someone to talk on whether it's a teenage pregnancy or whether it's about uh, psychosocial health. Um, we invite speakers from the UNHCR to do that, but also we have the teachers on board to help. So I'm not doing it um, all by myself. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. You definitely have answered uh, my question. I thank you so much for your time today. Again, thanks for speaking of psychosocial support, gender inclusive language, the importance of uh, ICT, of course, um, the, so, and the support that you have received and that you are providing to your community once again. So thanks again for joining us. I will uh, now uh, uh, move to our next speaker and I would like to welcome Nayel Deng to speak. He's a youth activist who notably worked in empowering young people as peace builders and social entrepreneurs. Welcome, Nayel. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for the kind introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Nayel Deng, uh, and I'm joining you now from, uh, from London, Ontario, in Canada, where I'm attending college. I am a South Sudanese refugee, writer, and community activist. I was born and raised in Ethiopia where my father set up after fleeing the first Sudanese civil war. And um, in 2010, my village in Ethiopia was attacked uh, by her militias and later had to flee uh, to Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, where I, uh, where I lived for the last 11 years. Uh, my family uh, has been affected by war and conflict intergenerationally. Uh, when I arrived in Kakuma refugee camp, I was 11 years old. I was detached uh, from uh, my family. I was detached from my father. I was detached from my mother. I lost connection with my siblings. And I came to the refugee camp by myself alone. Uh, and uh, I was traumatized. I was devastated um, uh, by all the images, uh, the brutal images of violence I witnessed while fleeing my, my village in Ethiopia. And um, when I got to Kakuma refugee camp, the first thing that came to my mind was the school because I knew that um, education is the only uh, way uh, that I can uh, still secure a more full and brighter future, uh, not just for myself, but also for my community. And while I was in Ethiopia, uh, I had a dream uh, of being a journalist in the future. My dad used to have a small radio uh, and I would join him in the evening would listen to BBC together. And I told him one day that I would love to be on BBC so that you can also listen to me uh, and I can also share our stories with the world. And my dad told me I can't do it. All I need to do is master good English. And that really motivated me. Uh, I think that has been the driving force for me fighting so hard uh, to be able to uh, to attain an education because I knew that uh, that is the whole way I can make that dream a reality. And while I was fleeing my my my, uh, my village in Ethiopia, uh, I never wanted to leave my dad behind, but he told me that um, I will go to Kenya and I will be able to go to school and I'll be able to become a journalist and I can't find him uh, through the TV or radio. And I said, okay, dad, I will do it for you. Uh, when I get to Kakuma, uh, I was 11 years old. I knew no one. Uh, I went to the UNHCR compound uh, where I was registered as a refugee. I was given uh, identity document. I had no document in the first place. Um, and then I was able to go back to school again after uh, three months. Uh, and that was, uh, for me, uh, the turning point in my life. I love storytelling. Uh, and when I went to school, uh, you know, education gave me a space. The school for me was more than just a place of learning uh, where I could find knowledge, where I could learn about the world. It was a place where I could find solace, uh, where I was able to find hope, uh, where I was able to find courage uh, to continue dreaming big. And uh, I, was, I was in a tiny classroom. I still remember my classroom uh, sitting uh, with, with 120 kids uh, from more than 10 different countries. 
And the first few days of school, uh, I remember coming to the class. The class teacher introduced me and said, you have a new uh, student joining you today. And uh, I almost wanted to cry that first day because I never speak any good English. I didn't want to speak Swahili, which was uh, the language that every single um, uh, kid around me was speaking uh, when I got to school. And I was like, how do, how do I find myself here? I fell off. Uh, and then I went back to my teacher after that uh, first day in school and he told me, you know, uh, I can go to him and he will help me learn English and Swahili as well. Uh, so I'd go to my teacher uh, in the evening and, and just talk to him uh, about English and Swahili, learn a few things. Uh, he gave me assignments to go and do at home. So I worked really hard to improve my English. And when I was able to learn a few words, I started interacting with his students. And that was, uh, I think that was a big transformative thing for me. So I love his storytelling. And, and I would just, you know, talk to kids about their stories, uh, talk to them about their journey. I was able to make friends. I was able uh, to meet people who became very close to me in my life uh, at the school. And then um, I finished my primary school in the refugee camp. I went to high school. And in high school, uh, that was when I started uh, thinking uh, uh, critically about uh, my own story, about the psychology of my childhood, of war and violence and conflict. My dad used to tell me how he himself fled South Sudan, where I'm originally from. And I would sometimes get angry while I was growing up in Ethiopia. I'd be like, why don't I have a chance to go back and live in South Sudan? Even if my dad would tell me stories of how uh, uh, war, 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 uh, war helicopters would come and just drop bombs and they had to run, uh, go and hide in, in the nearby bush and thicket. Uh, but to me, I was I was really trying to connect with South Sudan and what and what it means to me and and if it was really hope for me, and if home was the place where I where I originally come from or if home was the people around me. So I start thinking about my own journey, my childhood. I start thinking about uh, the people I was meeting in the school, talking to them. And then when I was when I was in senior year in high school, I realized that I I have been able to let go most of my trauma uh, by just being able to listen to the stories of, of kids around me. But I realized that most of my classmates and schoolmates were still uh, trying to find their own voice. They still have uh, a lot of uh, challenges they were facing. Uh, and I thought one day, is there anything I can do about this? I, I, you know, I thought like I could just bring them together. Uh, so one evening after classes, I asked one of my friends, Gabriel, I tell Gabriel, hey, Gabriel, can you help me? He said, what do you need help with? I said, let's pick a few chairs, take them under a small tree outside and invite our friends. So we did that. We took the chairs outside, invite our friends. And that was the first meeting of the Refugee Peace Ambassadors. Uh, we just talk about our stories, we talk about our dreams, we talk about our realities, we talk about our hopes, we talk about the challenges we face in the camp, uh, we talk about, you know, our schools, what education means to us. It was very transformative. You could hear from someone who has been through the same experience like yourself. And uh, that was the beginning of my community work. Uh, that was the beginning of my advocacy as well. Uh, so after that first project, uh, every Wednesday, we used to have gathering in school where we just come and talk about our stories. Um, and, you know, uh, we started in December of 2017. By the end of 2019, we had more than 1,000 young people across the camp participating in our programs uh, and, and activities uh, ranging from peace building workshop, from mentorship program uh, that, we all, uh, that we host in the camp uh, to social um, entrepreneurship workshop, uh, trainings, game and sport activities, uh, community dialogues. My main aim was just to bring young people to a space where they could learn skills that will help them be leaders in their community because I felt that uh, countries ravaged by war can very much rely on those that are displaced to be able to go back one day and rebuild those countries. And I see young people uh, as, as a source of hope for those countries, not just South Sudan. I connect with young people from Somalia. I meet young people from DRC in the refugee camp. Uh, and I felt like this was the future of this country. Why don't we invest in them? So uh, what I was trying to do was creating a space where these young people could let go of their trauma, but they could also be able to learn skills, be leaders in their communities. We used to have a very huge ambassadorship program where uh, after we host a peace-building training, we bring young people into... Uh, the organization and ask them to be peace ambassadors in their own communities. Uh, and they work toward promoting peace. They work toward uh, uh, being advocates in their communities. And after that, I just I just felt like there were a lot of incredible stories that I was seeing in the camp. So 
I was, I said, I will not just get involved in the refugee camp, but also try to engage with composition happening around the world. So I started creating social media accounts and I just post about things that uh, excite me in the camp. Uh, there are images of, of devastations, of, 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 uh, of frustrations, uh, of destruction, but they also the stories of resilience. And those were the things that I was trying to tell to the world. Uh, that the refugee crisis has two uh, different stories. Uh, they, are, they are the images of resilience, but they're also uh, the stories, uh, uh, you know, of destruction. And both are important. Uh, so it's just, you know, I start sharing those stories, getting involved in conversation, getting involved in different projects in the camp. And that is how my whole story began. So last year, um, uh, this, okay, uh, end of 2020, I said I want to now to go to school, be able to achieve my dream of being a journalist. Uh, and then I started applying to school, and that is how I ended here in Canada. But I'm still very much uh, involved in advocacy. I'm very much still involved in, in community uh, project back in the camp. The Refugee Peace Ambassadors is running. I went back to Kakuma in December uh, 2021 uh, to set up Shilix Kakuma, which I'm working with with AWA. And then we now have 35 young uh, college students across Canada uh, providing mentorship to young people uh, in the camp, young women and girls. And, and uh, yeah, this is what fascinated me. I'm now working on a on a book drive, mobilizing 10,000 books to go back to Kakuma uh, later this year to set up a community Excellent. library, which I'm very excited about. And I've been talking to students across Canada who are willing to support the need books one or two. Uh, so this is how my journey begins. And um, I very much look forward to what, to what lies ahead. But uh, for me, it's just being able to share these stories of young people who have so much potential and who can really help in rebuilding their countries and communities. Thank you very much. Excellent, Nail. Thank you so much. I can tell that you're that you like storytelling. Uh, thank you for sharing your your experiences, uh, your experiences of war, of adaptation, of learning a new language, and then of bringing people together. And again, having support networks both uh, both uh, in Africa and in Canada now is what I understand from your from your latest intervention. So we, I really appreciate uh, you sharing with that. I will go to questions because we have about uh, eight minutes. Uh, to uh, to uh, to get through the next uh, um, speaker. Uh, so the first question, I, I find it quite beautiful. What do you think has been the most powerful gift education provided you? Uh, I think to me, the most powerful gift uh, would be uh, finding solace and hope. Uh, I think those are two very important things in my life. Uh, when I fled my country, I was traumatized. I was crying. I saw I saw uh, houses being burned down. I saw someone is uh, uh, bleeding on the ground. Uh, I saw I had gunshots. Uh, I had to scream, and those really traumatized me. But when I got to school, I was able to find solace, and then I was able to find hope again. And hope made me uh, be an advocate in my community and made me fight for my dreams. Uh, so I put it in those two: finding solace and hope. Beautiful. Uh, another question for the chat. What kind of support do refugee organizations such as yourself need to continue your work around education for refugees and display children or youth? The kind of support that's needed for your work. Um, I, I think there's, there's a lot of support that is needed. One, one very much uh, critical area is funding uh, refugee-led organizations across the world face a lot of barriers in being able to access funding. Uh, so trying uh, to create uh, flexible funding for these organizations is, is something that I believe uh, will help them be able to do a lot of incredible work that they that they that they do in their communities and and, and you know be able to uh, to maximize their impact and then providing capacity building as well or even mentorship you know uh, I have, you know uh, as I said right now I'm working on this project where we you know has college students across Canada a recent graduate for to be mentors to young girls and women back in Kakuma who are just finishing high school. Uh, so CEOs or even, uh, you know, uh, head of international organizations can volunteer their time and provide mentorship to these young people who are starting organizations in the camp for capacity building, uh, exploring opportunities for partnership, uh, you know, uh, on different projects that they are working on, I think would be a key for them to be able to advance their work as well. Uh, and most importantly, trying to give them a platform where they can share uh, the, the impact they're making in their communities. Excellent. You mentioned uh, that you're now working in supporting girls and adolescents too in refugee camps. Uh, is there something, different considerations that need to be applied? Were their experience different? If you can speak to, to that, there was a question in the chat as well. 
Uh, yes, uh, to me, you know, I would say that come, I come from a patriarchal sort of community uh, where women are seen as they, they don't belong to certain places. And uh, uh, I, I, you know, while I, as I, while I was in Kakuma, I would just speak to girls and they have the same dreams I had while I was in school. Uh, I talked to my classmates, they have the same dreams. And I was like, you know, we need the same opportunities for girls and boys. But also we do not just need the same opportunities. We also need to work really hard to address uh, you know, a lot of different barriers that girl face uh, than boys. Uh, and, and that is what, for me, motivated me to go back to the camp. So uh, while I was still in the camp, I started speaking about uh, gender equality. I started getting involved with different organizations, trying to push to have more uh, girl voices in decision-making processes in the camp, uh, have more opportunities for girls to be leaders in schools, to be leaders in communities. Uh, and then I get involved with the Mindy Labor Young Leaders Program, uh, where they provide training to young leaders from across the world who are passionate about gender equality, and they also, you know, give funding to young leaders as well. They're the one funding Shilits Kakuma, the project I'm working on right now. Uh, so to me, it is just these stories, talking to girls and realizing that they have the same dreams I have. They have the same dream than all the boys in my class, but they also face a lot of many different barriers. Uh, that is why I said uh, we need, we don't just need equal opportunities. We need to address different barriers that girls face. Thank you so much for sharing that. And on that note, I will thank you again for, for uh, explaining and describing your story and also for showing how you're now contributing again uh, to, uh, to, uh, to those that have, a similar, have had a similar journey than you. So thank you so much for your time today. We're going to go to our next speaker now, and I would like to introduce you our final speaker, Laura Barbosa. Laura is an educator, community worker, and human rights advocate. Uh, born in Colombia and now living in Canada. Mucho gusto, Laura. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes, everyone. Um, I'm from Colombia, a country that, like many other countries, lack basic needs such as education. Uh, my mother was murdered when I was 12 years old, and my father was disappeared when I was 13 by illegal groups uh, in Colombia. My sister and I faced different challenges. Uh, we were separated, had to change the schools and cities for our own safety. Uh, my family, my great support, taught me that education is what opened the doors to a world of opportunities in the midst of challenges. I grew up in a family of educators. Uh, most of my uncles and aunts are high school or university teachers. I witnessed the daily struggle they went through to help youth and children in Colombia to have access to quality education. I even had the opportunity to attend some of their classes and educational projects in vulnerable communities of Colombia. I saw how fearless and, and committed they were uh, to support their own students and, and you know, to support these communities and also to find resources needed to provide quality education. Uh, this experience were a milestone in my life. Uh, due to these challenges, I moved to China in 2011. I learned Mandarin and I also work and volunteer and travel throughout Asia. Um, I visited Cambodia, Thailand and Turkey. Uh, these all countries had something in common. Not every child had access to education. Uh, in Cambodia, for instance, I saw her mother was selling her own daughter to a foreigner so she could feed the rest of her family. In Thailand, uh, I see girls selling their own bodies so they could support their family. And in Turkey, I saw Syrian refugee children begging in the streets uh, and not attending schools. So though they all had beautiful cultures, they, though they are all amazing countries, they all had something in common. And that's what happens in Colombia. Children and youth don't have access to quality education or don't even have access to any sort of education. Um, my passion for education continue uh, growing. Uh, I was not only able to enhance my skills in education, uh, but I was also able to see firsthand the challenges of youth and children, uh, you know, the challenges that they had to access education. In 2014, I decided to make my career in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, in public relations. I also volunteer uh, teaching in a refugee in Myanmar center uh, with children between the ages of nine and 16. It is worth mentioning that at this refugee camp, all the children attending schools were a total of nine boys and only one girl. 
There are so many reasons why girls are not attending classes. Uh, some of them are because they were pregnant, early pregnancy, because they were uh, married at an early age, or because they had to cook and, you know, do the household work. So it, it was something that, you know, it's, it's it's in my heart and I saw this, their struggles. Like my family, my purpose was to find a way to drive home an important principle. And that was to nurture their aspirations, their confidence, their curiosity, uh, imagination, their self-respect and responsibility to others. Um, I moved to Canada in 2019 with my husband. This was also a chance for me to reunite with my sister and be together after uh, nine years of being apart. Um, in June 2020, I joined an organization called Students Offering Support, uh, a student-led charity that strives to create positive learning environments uh, to help youth reach their full potential nationally and in international and in uh, Latin American communities, especially vulnerable communities. In 2020 was also when I joined the Education Refugee Council. Uh, this was a dream come true, an opportunity also, uh, and, as, and a space where I could share the stories of the children I met and that for different circumstances are not attending school. Uh, you know, there are so many struggles, there are so many reasons to that, lack of financial support, there is high rates of gender inequality, lack of school and infrastructure, uh, work, among others. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura. I, I can see education is, your, is in your DNA uh, and you've been able to bring that uh, skill set to a lot of different countries. So thank you for also sharing what you've seen elsewhere, and obviously uh, being inspired by uh, your uh, your time and work in Colombia as well. So thank you so much. We do have a, a few questions for you. So the first one would be, what would you say to a father that is hesitant to send their daughter to school? I will say, give her an opportunity because that girl is going to show you that if you give her an opportunity, she's going to bring the best, the best of everything. I, I actually am part of a program called the Guatemala Groundswell Program. And in this program, we are supporting indigenous Mayan youth uh, in Guatemala. We had that case where a father said, I don't want to send my daughter to school because she's going to get married, she's going to get pregnant, I'm going to waste my money. And then we say, just give her the opportunity and see what's going to come out of that. Uh, now she's in second semester of medicine. She's the first one finishing high school, and she's going to be the first doctor in her community, female doctor. So you see, there are different things that a, a woman can do if you give her the opportunity because she has the skills, she has the commitment. Excellent answer. And again, how uh, the trajectory can change dramatically of somebody if they can go to school and if they have those conversations. So uh, a great example as well. Uh, second question, um, the manifesto speaks to the importance of partnership. And the person asking is wondering if you could talk a little more about successful, what successful partnerships look like. To me, successful partnership is those partnerships with, where we understand the local context of the communities where we are going to work in. Um, a, a successful partnership should be someone who is able to fully see what's going on in those communities. Uh, for instance, in the communities where I'm working in, in Guatemala, we partnership with a, a, a local organization called Guest Rising. This organization focuses on gender equality workshops. Uh, they understand what's going on in Guatemala. They understand that indigenous Mayan youth there are facing war and that for so many reasons, um, you know, they they don't have access to education, they don't have access to opportunities. But if we don't have those partnerships, how are we to know what they really need? Uh, a good partnership is also capable of monitoring uh, what's going on in the community. Uh, it happens that, you know, we have many partnerships, but there is no monitoring, there is not um, a feedback, or there is not a follow-up on what's going on. And so, 
though there are many projects are very few which are really, really successful. Excellent. Um, another question. In your work in the refugee camp, do you have lessons learned in getting girls to come or stay in schools? So you talked about that one example where you spoke to the father, but you have other lessons learned on how to keep uh, girls in, uh, in the education system. I believe that training uh, parents, teachers, uh, it's very important to actually create, change the mindset of the world and especially of these communities. We provided training in their own languages. So developing a curriculum with uh, their own dialect was something that we learned was useful. Uh, we had different storytellings and different stories in their own Mayan languages. And when ma mothers and parents were watching at these stories, they actually say, you know what, what you are saying is right. Why a woman cannot be a mayor or why a woman cannot be a president. And, and so developing that sort of curriculum uh, that it's emphasizing on or is capturing the audience of parents and teachers is really important. Training, we need a space where they can discuss those topics, where they can say, okay, what are the stereotypes of our community? Uh, what are the, the, you know, the challenges, the barriers, the cultural norms? We need to understand the way how they think and the way how they behave in order to change a behavior. So yeah, those were mainly training, um, curriculum development, uh, language barriers to just provide that sort of uh, complementation, I will say, package. <laughs> Excellent. And then both Morgera and, and Niall talked about the importance of psychosocial support in the work uh, that, uh, that everybody's doing. Can you speak a bit more about how you see it and how important it is and how to provide it? Uh, it's really, really important. Losing my mother and my father at some point uh, challenged me. Uh, I, I actually thought, you know, there is war, there is no opportunities. Uh, my mother was murdered and no one did anything. My father was disappeared and no one did anything either. So emotionally and, you know, mentally, I, I wasn't stable. And when you're not stable, you cannot actually uh, take advantage of those opportunities given to you. Uh, for a period of time, and actually in high school, I didn't give the best of me because I wasn't stable at the time. I needed to talk about what had happened to me. Uh, the same goes with the, the youth that I'm working with. Sometimes they just talk to me and they say, you know, in Guatemala we face war or even in Colombia we face war, but we don't talk about it. We just have to wake up the next day and continue doing what we have to do. But there is no safe space to discuss those challenges. So it's very important because when we don't have psychosocial support, uh, it's difficult to just take advantage of, of the opportunities given to us. Thank you so much. And thanks for your, uh, for your candid testimony too, in terms of uh, having, having to also deal with oneself to be able to support others as well. So I will end here um, in terms of uh, thanking uh, Laura for her, uh, for her testimony and for engaging in this set today's session. I will say thank you to all three uh, panelists. I think we're all, I can speak on behalf of everybody that's listening to us this morning. Um, I'm personally very inspired uh, by your skills, by your commitment, by your desire to give back. That's, that has trans transcended in everybody's uh, testimony and, 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 uh, and description of their journeys. So, so thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. I will encourage all attendees to tune in tomorrow for the launch of the Refugee Education Council Anthology and to share it with their network. I'm sorry, we lost the connection there uh, with the ambassador, but I know she was encouraging you all to come tomorrow to join in the launch of the Refugee Education Council's anthology. Um, this is a, a collection of stories from the, the Refugee Education Council members. And we encourage you to share it across your networks as well when it's released. It's a wonderful advocacy tool uh, to encourage all stakeholders to get involved in the education sector and to understand the lived experiences of displaced youth and how that needs to shape the work that we do. Um, 
And we want to thank everyone in the Refugee Education Council for your ongoing engagement. I've had the privilege of meeting a few of them in person and of meeting all of them online as we are all doing so much more lately. And um, I'm just continually struck by how valuable it has been for me uh, directing a team with this with this campaign uh, to have that perspective come to mind. And, and certainly the thing that I've often taken away the most is that when we talk about displaced children and youth, an inclusive education absolutely must address the mental health and the psychosocial supports needed uh, to deal with some of the very traumatic experiences that um, they've had in their young lives. 